Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for bringing us together once again for this day. We thank you because of what we've been learning. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for the word that will never fail. We pray, O oh Lord, that as we come to the pages of the scripture now, you'll speak very definitely to every one of us in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that you reach out into our hearts and lives so that something definite will be done. And where we've gone wrong in this area that your word is going to confront us with now, we pray that you correct us, redirect us, lead us in the path of righteousness in Jesus' name. Speak to everyone. In Jesus' name, we pray. We're addressing the important subject of the speech and the work of true overcomers. The speech and the work of true overcomers. We cannot separate these two areas of the believer's life. The walk he walks, that is the life he lives his behavior and conduct, and then the speech, the talk. Because the scripture has brought these two things together, one you will find in the life of the believer. His speech, his work are brought together. In the life of the unbeliever, his speech also and his work are brought together. In Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Verse 6, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that she may know how ye ought to answer every man. You'll find that in verse 5, 
It talks about our walk. Our walk talks about the completeness of our living. The way in which we comport ourselves. The way in which we live. And then immediately it talks about walking in wisdom. Even towards those that are without. Redeeming the time. Then it goes on immediately to the speech, the utterance, the words coming from our mouth. In Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, from verse 15. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. In verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. In verse 15, he talks about the way we walk, circumspectly. We walk properly. We walk scripturally. We walk carefully. We walk Christ likely. And then he describes for us the reason, the purpose. Of our walking properly, carefully, Christ likely. It tells us we need to redeem the time because the days in which we live are evil. And then he talks of not being unwise, but understanding the will of God and walking, living according to that will of God, not getting involved with wine, wherein there is excess. But being filled, continually filled with the Spirit of God. And then he tells us, as it relates the scriptures to our lives, our behavior. Then he also talks about speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So you will see the connection between the work of the believer and the speech of the believer. How about the unbeliever? Is the walk connected with the speech? Is the behavior connected with the utterance? Jude, verse 16. Jude, verse 16. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's Persons in admiration because of gain, unlawful gain because of advantage. So you will see that for the unbeliever too, his walk, his conduct, his manner of life is connected with the speech, the words coming out from him. He talks of the unbeliever as the one complaining, criticizing murmuring, grumbling. And then it says, the reason for that after all is that he is walking after his own lost. In Second Peter chapter 3, Second Peter chapter 3, from verse 3 and verse 4, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, Walking after their own lusts. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Once again here you can see the unbelievers described in two ways. We are told that the scoffers, how do they scoff? They scoff and scorn, and ridicule, and criticize with the words of their mouth. And then he tells us in that same verse 3 that they will be walking after their own lusts. 
after telling us about how they walk, how they live. Then he tells us in verse 4, what they say. Can you see those two things together again? The talking and the walking. The behavior and the utterance. The conduct and the conversation. Those two things coming together. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? And so we need to check up the index of our lives. How you speak, what you speak about, what you are talking about, how you walk, how you live, how you behave. Will tell whether you are an overcomer. And whether you are planning to be an overcomer or you are already defeated. The speech and the walk of true overcomers. Want to examine three points. Number one, the spiritual state of true overcomers. Spiritual state of true overcomers. Number two, tongues of heaven bound pilgrims. The tongues of heaven bound pilgrims. Number three, the walk of rapturable saints. The walk of rapturable saints. Number one, the spiritual stage, the spiritual condition, the spiritual life, the spiritual conduct of true overcomers. You need to understand the word overcome. When there is a battle and you are engaged in that fight and then you are able to overcome or defeat the opponent, then we say you have overcome. And we need to know that every human being in this life is engaged in a battle. There is a fight. And that fight is a fight that decides how happy or miserable you will be in this life. And how happy or miserable you will be in the life to come. It is an age-long battle. And everyone that comes into this world is involved in that battle. Before you were born again at all, before you ever knew the Lord, that battle had been on. It's the battle between good and evil. And the battleground where the war is being waged has been and was your very heart. Where the devil was trying to claim you for evil permanently. And God was beckoning you for good and for righteousness. Not only temporarily, but permanently and to all eternity. And the battle was on. And the battle was raging. And you needed to take a decision. As a sinner, you had no weapon to fight against sin. And yet, sin was all the time waging war against you. There was no way you could overcome temptation. And yet, as a sinner, the temptations were coming every day. There was no way you could overcome the flesh, the lusts, the desires of the flesh. And yet all these desires of the flesh were fighting against you. There was no way you could overcome Satan. And he came with all his attacks. He came with all his affliction. He was waging war against your soul. There was no way you could overcome even the flesh and the doubts and the unbelief that came against your life. And all these things came against you. And you had to wrestle. You had to fight. And this is what the whole world is all about. As we are talking now, everyone in this life, in this world, is engaged in that spiritual battle. And even as you have become a Christian, as you have become born again, the devil is not leaving you alone, saying, well, you have gone from the kingdom of darkness. You have been born again. Your name is now in the book of life. Bye-bye. I have nothing to do with you anymore. 
you can go on your way to heaven. Let me go and pace and focus attention on all the other people. He's still fighting. Because we're told he goes to and fro, up and down, seeking whom he may devour. And he's still fighting against you. And you need to realize that the outcome of that battle will determine how miserable or happy you'll be in this world. The outcome of that battle will also determine where you will spend eternity. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Paul the apostle affirmed, we wrestle. We're fighting. There is a fight. There is a battle. And you better recognize there is a battle because otherwise you will not be able to overcome. Not only that we're told, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called. And hast professed a good profession. Before many witnesses. So then it means. That the battle is raging on. And a question you want to ask yourself is. Are you fighting to overcome? Or have you so surrendered to the devil that although the battle is raging on, you are not overcoming? In Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. So then you see that there is a battle. Battle against your soul, against the decision you have taken, against the decision to follow after the Lord. First Peter chapter 2, verse 11. First Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war, which fight against the soul. So then you will see that there is a battle. Sin wants to re-enter into your life. The flesh wants to overcome your spirit. Evil wants to overcome good in your life. The darkness wants to put out the light in your life. The forces of the kingdom of darkness are trying to pull you back into the world and into the kingdom of Satan. All the demons and all the cohorts of hell conspire together wanting you to get back into under your master your old master the devil although jesus christ is waiting for you in heaven saying i prepared a place for you but you still decide where you will spend eternity that's why we need to find out whether you are a true overcomer or you are being conquered by the flesh by temptations, by sin, by evil, by the world. We need to find out whether you are an overcomer or you are a victim. In First John chapter 5 and from verse 4. First John chapter 5 verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world and this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth 
that Jesus is the Son of God. Here we see the prerequisite for becoming an overcomer. We see the condition for becoming an overcomer. You cannot overcome the devil or the flesh or sin or the world or evil or darkness or anything that is negative against righteousness and holiness until you are born again. That's why Jesus Christ said, ye must be born again. And you do not want to make any assumption saying, I think I'm born again. I've been in this church for a long time. I think I'm born again. I've been a worker in our region. I think I'm born again. I've attended workers' retreats. I think I'm born again. I've been here in this workers' retreat from the very beginning. I think by now I am born again. No, we need to check up whether you are really born again. One, if you are truly born again, you will have the faith that overcomes the world. If you are not overcoming... The flesh, sin, Satan, and the world, then you are not born again. Because the faith that gets us into the kingdom of God, by which we are born again, makes us to overcome the world. And therefore, you need to check up your testimony of being born again. You see, we meet many people today who say they are born of God. But secrets overcome them. They say they are born of God. Alcohol overcomes them. They say they are born of God. Polygamy overcomes them. They say they are born of God. Their old girlfriend is still overcoming them to pull them back into fornication. They say they are born again. The old man, the sin partner is still overcoming them to pull them back into adultery. They say they are born again, but masturbation, once the thought comes, they get right into it. And they say they are born again. They are overcome by the filthiness of the flesh. They say they are born again, but then covetousness has not gone away from their lives. They say they are born again, and lies and deception are still overcoming them. They say they are born again, but bribery and corruption you will still find in their lives. They will tell you they are born again, but you will see that they still dress like the world. They still look like the world. They still drink what the world is drinking. They still smoke what the, sm what the world is smoking. And they still gamble as the world is gambling. They say they are born again, but the songs of the world you still find in their mouth. They say they are born again, and the, the, the corrupted and the corrupting games of the world, they still play they say they are born again, and you will still find that all the customs of the world, and the thinking of the world, and the direction the world is going, is the direction they are still going. They are not born again according to the testimony of scripture. When we say we are born again, you know what that means? It means you have that kind of saving faith, overcoming faith, that overcomes the devil. The devil will come with temptation. But then, like Jesus Christ, you'll be able to say, It is written, therefore you overcome. Not only that, the world will invite you. The world will invite you to their stadium. The world will invite you to their shrine. The world will invite you to their festival. The world will invite you to their games. The world will invite you to their naming ceremonies. The world will invite you to their uh, building dedication ceremonies. The world will invite you to all the things the worldly people are doing. Their festivities. But then, as they invite you, if you are really born again, this is the faith that is, uh, overcomes the world. You'll overcome all those things. Not only that, the flesh will also say, are we going to stay like this? Shall I go back to the grave? No immorality, no dancing, no drinking, no casino, no gambling, no lottery. Are we going to stay like this? He won motorcycle by taking all those tops of the bottles, the covers of uh, Coke and the cover of Sprite and packing it with his pocket. You know, we Christians, real Christians, we used to pack our bags and our pockets with trucks anywhere we go. 
But now, now are they Christians? They pack their pockets with the tops of Coca-Cola. Because they are all they are peeling instead of opening their Bible to read their Bible and to know that it is my God that shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. They are peeling the back of the tops. And I say because so and so won a motorcycle, so and so won sewing machine, and so and so won a pigeon vehicle, and so and so he even won something. Maybe I can get something. Now the Coca-Cola top is their God. If that is what will supply all their need now. They say, you know, I'm trying to get married. And as I'm getting married, how am I going to be able to get this and get that? I may win a house. I may win a motorcycle. You see, covetousness and gambling and lottery will be away from your life when you are born again. Because it says, this is the faith that overcomes the world. Even the faith we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the beginning of the overcoming life. You realized you were a sinner. You realized you couldn't help yourself. And you were beaten by the scourge of the scripture. And you were knocked and caught by the sword of the spirit. And then he drove you on your knees unto Calvary. You said, Lord, I'm a wretched, miserable, dirty sinner. Have mercy upon me. And as you called upon the Lord, repenting of your sin, turning away from all evil, then you welcome Jesus Christ into your heart. He pardoned you. He changed your life. And the things you used to love, you don't love them anymore. The things, the painting you used to have, you don't have them anymore. The palming that you used to rejoice in, you don't love it anymore. The coloring of your fingernails and of your toenails you used to love, you don't like that anymore. And the places you used to go Saturday night to go and waste your life and waste your time, you don't go there anymore. And the sacrifices of idols and uh, idolatrous festivals you used to eat, you cannot eat that anymore. That's what the Bible means when it says you are born again. You are born into a different realm, into a different kingdom, into a different lifestyle. All things have passed away and behold, how many things have become new? I said how many things have become new? All things have become new. Have you listened to the testimonies of those people? Oh yes, I'm born again. I used to smoke uh, 10 sticks of cigarette, but now I smoke only 3. Have you listened to those people that say, now I'm born again. I used to be uh, you know, a person that was a womanizer. And I used to have, you know, about 5 uh, girlfriends all at the same time, but now I have only one. Have you listened to the testimonies of those people? I used to pack all my box and all my wardrobe with all this jewelry. And you know, in the neck and on the air and everywhere. But you know, I'm born again now. And what I use now is very, very moderate. Jewelry, just that little thing in my ear. You see, when you are born again, the Bible says, all things have become new. And if that has not happened, then you have not got that saving faith. The faith that links us with Jesus Christ. That we know that this is an overcomer. I pray that every one of us, before we finish, you will be an overcomer in Jesus' name. What if you have still been overcome? In 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. I'm reading there from verse 19. 2 Peter chapter 2 from verse 19. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome. Of the same is he brought into bondage. Whatever sin overcomes you, brings you into bondage. It may be that here we are, you really want to serve the Lord, but there is a particular lady may even be in the church, may be coming to deeper life, but you've messed up your life in the past with that lady. And then you now want to repent. But the lady is not ready to repent yet. And then you come to Calvary. You come to the cross. You say, Lord, I repent. Lord, I give it up. And then that lady, still coming to church, will see you and say, uh, how about uh, coming to stay in your house tonight? Oh no, I'm born again now. All that life of hypocrisy, all the life of deception, 
of the, of the life of looking like an angel outwardly, but being a devil, a fornicator inside. I don't want that anymore. Ah, uh, if you take that stand and you leave me like that and you give me heartbreak because I cannot leave you and for you and uh, God will forgive us and after all uh, God understands and you say no I want to live right uh, if you take that stand you say you want to live right because now you've gone to workers retreat and you want to remain a worker I know how to make you fall I will go to the overseer and confess that this is what we have been doing together. And they are going to remove you like jigger from the foot. Immediately I confess that thing. And then, then you begin to tremble. You say, I'm a house fellowship leader. I would rather keep my house fellowship and go to hell. I am a preacher already. I would rather keep my preaching and live in hypocrisy and go to hell. And you say, well, lady, if that is so, don't go and report. Don't go and say anything. Well, whatever you want, we will continue. That lady has overcome you. You are in bondage to that lady. Or it may be that you are the lady. You really want to give your life to the Lord. You want to serve the Lord. You have repented. You have given your life to the Lord. Maybe at this very time. And the fellow you've been living in careless life together. Amen. He himself is, um, you know, a parrot on the pulpit. is preaching. But he doesn't experience what he's preaching about. And here you are, days retreat, you gave your life to the Lord. And you said, never, never. Immorality, never. Fornication, never. Adultery, never. I'm going to live a clean life. And then, while we preach a message like this, immediately after the message, after you have prayed and cried and wept and said, Oh God, I'm going to go with you. All through my life, this man, a Judas in the midst of the disciples, this man, a demons in the company and the companions of Paul the Apostle. This man, a Saul in the kingdom of Israel. This man, a Korah, a Dathan, and a Byram. This man, a fellow that has swallowed up the devil. The devil has, uh, has filled his heart to, to fall himself and to make other people fall. Immediately we finish the meeting like this, he'll be looking for you. And then as maybe he's able to find you at the gate there or somewhere there. And he sees that your eyeballs are red. You've been crying tears of repentance. You've been saying, oh God, I will never do that thing. Oh God, I will never do that thing. Oh God, I will never go back. I want to be an overcomer. And here this fellow finds you. You look sober. You look quiet. The tears are almost still there. And the eyeballs are red with crying. And then she says, I need to see you. We need to talk together. When can we talk? I say, I don't think I want to talk now. Ah, you have to talk. Why? Uh, is it because of what they are preaching? That's how they've been preaching it. This is your first time of coming to Walker's Retreat. I came before. And I've been coming ever since. And I will continue to come. Is it uh, what uh, G.S. preached? That's the way he talks. You don't listen to his cassettes. You don't listen to all. That's the way they talk. Uh -uh. You have just come. Let us talk, my friend. And uh, then you say, no, I don't think I want to talk. No, you will have to talk. After all, the Bible says love one another. Did you hear that song they sang? Love one another. You hate me now. You say you are born again. You hate me. You say that you are a child of God. You hate me. You have no forgiveness. You cannot love me again. And this uh, sister will just say, ah, not that I hate you. If you don't hate me, we should talk. Do you know what I wanted to say? And then they go into a corner. And actually, what we did, God is a God of love. God understands. There's no human being that doesn't have a but in his life. That is our weakness. And God understands. And God will forgive us. And then by deception, and joining and twisting and distorting verses of scripture. Eventually, we even begin to hold that sister. Say, hey, don't mind all that we did. I'm not committing sin. I'm just trying to pet you. I'm just trying to make you understand that I don't have a threat for you at all. After all, in fact, it's you that pulled me to that thing. I never did it in my life before. And it is because of the love I had for you that made me to go into that kind of thing. In any case, uh, you know, I have prayed and I know that God is a good God. 
and uh, i hope you don't go and tell anybody that this was what is going on if people see you crying like this and they know you've been area leader and women representatives they'll be asking you what happened to you so cheer up and you know don't be sorrowful like at all and eventually they'll come they'll continue again and that lady is overcome and you come into bondage until you are ready to take the cutlass and the knife of scripture and you cut that rope binding you to that man binding you to that woman you'll never never be free you will always be conquered but you are going to take a decision that by the grace of god i have met jesus christ at this retreat i will never part with jesus christ again i'm going to take my stand because i know if i go back into those evil things and i'm overcome again then i come into bondage look at verse 20 for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the lord and savior jesus christ they are again entangled therein and overcome the latter end is worse with them than the beginning if after coming to this retreat you heard the word of god you wept before the lord you repented before the lord you called upon the lord for forgiveness and pardon for transformation and god said i'm a merciful god i will forgive you i will pardon you and you are pardoned and after that forgiveness if you go back to your locations to your town to your village or to your city and you are again entangled with that man again entangled with that woman again entangled with that uh, bribery or corruption in your place of work again entangled with evil the bible says your latter end will be worse than before you even came to the retreat because when an evil spirit goes out of a man he begins to seek a place where he will live and finding none he comes back if he sees that all your vow is gone all your consecration is gone all your decision is gone all the holiness is gone every good thing that god had given you is gone he finds the place empty he goes to take seven more wicked spirits than himself and he enters in and the latter state of such a man will be worse than the beginning I pray that will not happen to you. Verse 21. For it had been better. If. For them. Not to have known. The way of righteousness. Than after they have known it. To turn from the holy commandment. Delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them. According to the true proverb. The dog is returned is turned to his vomit again and the soul that was washed to her wallowing in the mire that's why we need to be real overcomers because it's only when we overcome that we'll be able to live the victorious life i pray that you'll make a decision and you'll stand by that decision that evil will not overcome you but that good will prevail in your life that holiness will prevail in your life. That righteousness will prevail in your life. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 21. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Be not overcome of evil. You know, hatred is evil. Do not be overcome with that evil of hatred. Bitterness sin immorality all those things are evil do not be overcome by evil false doctrine that is evil false association or evil association that is evil be not overcome with that which is evil but overcome evil with good and say no i trample underneath my feet all those things the temptation will come I trample them under feet. The devil may threaten. I throw that behind my back. And I'm going to be an overcomer. In Romans chapter 8. 
Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? I want to ask you a question. As you look at the condition of the country right now, what is happening in this country that is not described in verse 35? You talk about the economy. You talk about the joblessness. You talk about the hunger. You talk about the confusion. You talk about not being able to pay house rent. You talk about all the difficulties that people have today. And they are saying, how can I worship God? How can I still be a worker? How can I be serving God? And you talk about your salary not being, not being enough for you. What do we have now as problem that is not described here? Read it again. Who shall separate us? What shall separate us from the love of Christ? And begins to number them. Tribulation. Distress. Persecution. Farming, not enough to eat. Nakedness, not enough clothes to put on. Peril, all the dangers on the road. All the dangers from village to village, from town to town. Or within the city itself. Or sword. Then it says, as it is written, For thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Are we discouraged because of that? Are we going to give up because of that? Are we going to say, well, bye-bye to heaven, bye-bye to God, bye-bye to holiness, bye-bye to the Christian service because of that? Verse 37, nay. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We are more than conquerors. That's the language of the overcomer. That's the decision of the overcomer. And that is the condition of heart of the overcomer. Then he even adds in verse 39, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, human, satanic, or demonic, any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the language of the overcomer. And before you can overcome, you will need to have the armor of God completely upon you. In Ephesians chapter 6, from verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that she may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Don't just recommend the armors to other people, put it on. Don't just preach about the armor to other people, put it on. Don't just uh, praise and exalt uh, the goodness and the strength of the armor, put it on. Put on the whole armor of God. Don't just put a few on. Some people will say, you know what? Prayer is my special ministry. I about reading the Bible. I about overcoming temptation. I about standing in faith. Some people say, you know, I have this special ministry. Do you study the Bible? Well, that's not my special ministry. Do you have quiet time? Well, uh, I have quiet time, but you know what I do for quiet time? All I do is just pray. And you know, I just love praying. And I can pray for one whole hour. For even two hours. But the only problem I have is that once I open that Bible and I begin to read and study for myself, I feel sleepy. But you call us to pray. I can pray continually for two hours without sleeping at all. My friend, you don't have the whole armor on. Other people pray, but you don't have the shield of faith. And you know, I know some congregations where they will say, let us pray, let us pray, let us pray. And he'll pray for one hour, they'll pray for one hour, they'll pray for two hours, and those people, they are still being defeated. 
And you ask the people that are praying, they will say, you know, after we prayed last night and we prayed for two hours, immediately I went back home to sleep. Something was pressing me on the bed. The more I pray, the more trouble I have. Because you don't put on the whole armor. It is not only prayer, you need faith. Not only prayer and faith, you need the word of God. Not only prayer, faith and the word of God, you need the armor of righteousness. Not only the righteousness and the faith and the prayer, you also need the helmet of salvation. Not only that, you need the girdle, you need the belt of truth. Look at it from verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand, to withstand, you cannot withstand, you will not withstand, if you do not take on the whole ammo. Now, have you ever seen, you see when we come to work as a treat like this, or we have any retreat for that matter, you should be intelligent workers. And what I mean by that is always look, always look at the, always look at the program, and you will see a balance on the program. You'll never come for a workers retreat if I have the opportunity of planning that workers retreat where I only center on one thing. You see the program in your hand. You see all the messages there. We talk about sanctification. We talk about salvation. We talk about the Holy Ghost baptism. We talk of the word of God. We talk of the doctrines of the Bible. We talk of house fellowship. We talk of personal evangelism. We talk of various ministries within the church. We talk of overcoming worry and anxiety. We talk of the faith for deliverance and healing. We bring everything together and then we talk about steadfastness in your vow and consecration. You see, when you look at the program, you will know that the person who was used of God to draw that program understands the whole armor of God. But you know, there are some of our people, maybe they have come across a particular book in, the, in a particular bookshop. And as they read that book, it may be a particular book on territorial spirit. It may be a particular book on casting out devils. It may be a particular book on prayer. And they're so interested and fascinated with all they have read that for the next three months, all they are preaching about will be prayer and territorial spirit. The people are not going to be overcomers if you do that. You have to balance up everything. You have to talk of everything the Bible talks about if you have to put on the whole armor of God. It says, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Why? That ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, having done all to do what? To do what? To do what? To stand. You remember that young prophet? He came as the Lord told him to come. He spoke as the Lord sp told him to, sp to speak. And then the king said, take him, and his hand withered. He couldn't put it back again. And then what happened is that the king said, pray for me. He prayed for him. A miracle took place immediately. Come home with me and come and eat bread and drink water. Oh, he said, I may not drink water, ordinary water. Not wine, not alcohol, ordinary water. And I may not eat bread, not poison, not food sacrificed to idol, ordinary bread. I cannot do that because this is the word of the Lord unto me. That I will not drink water here. And I will not eat bread here. And I must not go back by the same route I came. And it went another way. But having done all to do what? To stand. But the man sat down. Relaxing. Do you know people that say, I have done enough. I've been a worker all these years. I've been a preacher all these years. I've been a pastor all these years. The work I have done, I think that's enough. I need rest. I need to relax. Because if I keep on walking and walking and walking and walking, how am I going to spend my life? Therefore, I need to rest. And while they're sitting down, remember that man. He was sitting down there. And then the old prophet in the city, his sons came to tell him, and he said, somebody came to town today, and something really terrific and special extraordinary happened. And he said, which way did he go? And he told him, he said, saddle the ass for me. And here he came. And the man was still sitting down, counting all his blessings, and counting all the miracles he did, and counting all the good words that he spoke, 
and counting all the victories that he won. He just relaxed there and said, wasn't that wonderful? I'm just a young prophet. Look at what I did. Look at the song I sang. Look at the message I preached. Look at the miracle I worked. Look at the boldness I manifested while counting all those things all alone by himself, congratulating himself that he had done something. He had accomplished something. Then the old prophet came and said, Are you the person I'm looking for? Are you that young prophet that came? Oh, yes, I am. I said, Why did you live without even touching my house? We are together. Have you not tried about unity? Why is it that you just finished and then you are gone? Well, I need to bring you back because I must uh, manifest Christian religious hospitality towards you. Oh, and the man said, I must not do that because the Lord told me not to eat in that place and the Lord did not make any exception. And then the man said, Oh, you can't do that. An angel spoke to me. How can I just leave my house? I'm a prophet myself like you are. How can I leave my house without hearing the voice of an angel? I'm telling you, there are many people today that will tell you, they won't read it to you from Genesis, or from Exodus, or from Leviticus, or Numbers, or Deuteronomy, or Joshua, or Judges. They won't read it to you from the Bible, they will say, an angel spoke to me. A vision came to me. An utterance came to me. An audible voice came to me. You better be very careful. So he said, an angel spoke to me and then said, I should bring you back. And then the Bible says there, but he lied unto him. Do prophets lie? Well, that one lied. Church ministers, bishops, yes, they lie. That one lied. And many people lie today. And this man, without ever checking up, he just rose up and said, well, if an angel spoke to you, I do not need to confirm it. Let's follow. And he followed. Do you know what happened to him eventually? A, a lion got him by the way eventually, tore him to pieces and killed him. Having done all, don't rest yet. Don't sit down yet. Having done all to stand. And then say, stand therefore. Stand therefore. Don't let your knees wobble. And don't let your feet be tired. And don't just go to sleep. Stand therefore. Having your loins girt about with truth. That's the very first one. You know, they accuse us in this church. They say, too much doctrine, too much doctrine, too much doctrine. That's the source of our victory. That's the secret of the growth of this church. That's the secret of the stability of the individual Christians and of the individual local churches. Having your loins girt about with truth. And having on the breastplate of righteousness. They say we talk too much on righteousness, uprightness, holiness. But that is a secret of going on with the Lord. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace. That's the gospel of the kingdom of God. Talking about the prince of peace who has come to bring peace into your own heart. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take... The helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit also, which is the watch of God. Then, praying always, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto, with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So then, we need to take all the armor upon us. If we do, we shall overcome. Now, once you become an overcomer like that, there are two things we need to notice in your life. Number one, your tongue. Number two, your walk. So then, let's go to the next point. The tongues of heaven-bound pilgrims. We're pilgrims. We're going on a journey. And there are things that will point you out that you are an heaven-bound pilgrim. The way you talk, your tongue, will tell us where you are going. And I want to remind you, please, that among the children of Israel that left the land of Egypt, and they were going to Canaan, many times it was their tongue that hindered them, 
that didn't allow those pilgrims to get to the land of promise. I'm sure you will remember Miriam. And you'll remember Aaron. What hindered her? What brought leprosy upon her? What delayed the whole of the children of Israel? For all the days that woman was leprous, her tongue. I'm sure you will remember Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. The people that were swallowed up in the earth under the fiery indignation and wrath and judgment of God. Again, it was their tongue. Then we must also remember the multitudes of the children of Israel. That the snakes were just coming from, all, from everywhere in the wilderness and biting them and they were dying. What caused that? Because of their tongue. And the snakes were biting them and they were dying. And we must remember too, our beloved leader, Moses. Very meek, very gentle, very consecrated, very committed, very powerful, very bold, very fearless. We must remember Moses, a person that gave up the prospect of being called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. We must remember that man that had such a conquering faith, that walked as sea, he had seen the invisible one. We must remember the one that the Bible comments about him, that everything the Lord told him, he did and Moses did according to the word of the Lord. We must remember this fellow that challenged not only Pharaoh, but the magicians and all the people of Egypt, challenging them of the truth and of the existence and of the power of the only true God. We must remember this bold individual that told the people, fear not, the Egyptians to see today, you will see them no more. We must remember that this individual was the person single-handedly with that single rod in his hand. The Red Sea was parted and also water came out of the rod. A wonderful leader. It's difficult to find any other leader like him. But his tongue. With all those qualities, his tongue did not allow him to get into that land of promise. The way he spoke and God said, you have not sanctified me, honored me before the people. And therefore you will not see the land. And that man fasted 40 days all over again. He went to the presence of God again. He sought the Lord again. And I'm sure you know that that man knew how to pray. Because it was through his prayer that when God said, leave, leave me alone, let me alone, and let my anger wax hot against the children of Israel, I will destroy them and make you a great nation. He said, God, don't do it. And that man began to pray. He knew how to pray. And then God said, because of your prayer, I've listened unto you, you have found grace in my sight, I will not destroy them anymore. But when it came to the damage done by his tongue, his prayer could not solve that problem. The tongue. And it was just that tongue that did not allow him to get to the land of promise. He cried, he prayed, he fasted, he pleaded with God, and God said, come up to the mountain." see it afar off you are so near not many miles anymore can you see that but here is where you will die why for a powerful man like that have you written books hero genesis exodus leviticus numbers return on him have you prayed to kings he prayed to pharaoh have you prayed to idol worshippers who oh, he confronted the magicians too have you prayed to children of God in a workers' retreat like this? He prayed to the elders of Israel. Have you comforted people? He comforted the people of God. Fear not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Have you provided miracle manner for the children of God by your prayer? You prayed for somebody. Provision came through his prayer and intervention. Manna came for those people. But with all that he did, with the great ministry that he had, he could not get in. Why? Because of his tongue. And that's going to be number one thing that you are going to focus on in your life. At home, between husband and wife. Some words can come out that can cut your relationship with God. Between the parents and the children. 
Some words may be uttered that will seal the possibility of continual usefulness with God. Between members and the church and leadership in the church, there have been some things that will happen. And then that engineering thing will come from your heart, wanting you to speak some things out. You may speak those things and you may never be able to have a ministry. Man will like to forgive and give you a ministry. But God will say, look at it, my work is still going to be done. The children of Israel will still get to the land of Canaan. But you that I wanted to use before to lead them into that place, you will not get there. You will not lead them. Let me get another person whose tongue has not been a problem. And Joshua can still replace Moses. That's why you want to be careful. That whoever you are, as you're on your pilgrimage, as you're on your way from the city of destruction here to the city of life, yonder, you want to make sure that your tongue does not cause you a problem to stay behind. How many people are falling by the wayside just because of their tongue? And I'm not just talking about people who are talkatives. The people who are talkatives, they have problems. And their problems, it will take supernatural miracle before they can ever come out of that and come right into the kingdom of god because it's a problem of something with that man you see all the power that heaven invested in the life of something he was a talkative he had other problems too because once you have the tongue problem you also have tons of other problems great great problems once you have the problem on your tongue, you cannot control it. You cannot keep it down. You cannot make it silent. You cannot be silent before the Lord and be still and see the salvation of the Lord. You are going to have tons of other problems. And so you, if a person is a talkative, it's going to be a terrible thing. Except there is a supernatural cure. I pray that supernatural cure will come today in Jesus' name. But you know, I'm not just talking about those who are talkatives. I'm talking about the people that speak just one sentence. Here was David rejoicing before the Lord. Because the ark of the covenant of the Lord had come. And once again, God had favored Israel to bring the ark, the manifestation of the presence of God, back to the land. And here was the wife of the king. Wife of the king. Pastor's wife, listen. Wife of the king. Overseer's wife, listen. Wife of the king. He, she looked at her husband like that, rejoicing before the Lord. Because if the ark of the covenant is not in Israel, what are we going to do? The presence of the Lord will not be in Israel. And so she not in tune with rejoicing before the lord not in tune with the joy of the lord and she said how is it look at how you have disgraced yourself before all the other women a whole king like yourself it's not talkativeness it's just that single sentence of ridicule you read in your bible she was barren for the rest of her life and think about Zechariah. You know, Zechariah, wonderful man. In fact, we're told in Luke chapter 1 verse 6 that Zechariah and Elizabeth, they walked in the presence of God before the Lord, blameless according to the word of God. They were totally blameless and he went in, just like we have come in here for retreat. He went in to serve the Lord. And while he was serving the Lord, an angel came and said, Zechariah, your prayer is answered. It's heard as a memorial before the Lord. And then Zechariah wasn't a talkative, you can tell. The man was not a talkative at all. How do we know that? Before that time, there is no record of too much of his speaking. And even after that time, when John the Baptist was born, and he said, what's his name? And the mother said, his name will be called John. They said, there's nobody like that before. Named in the family. And he gave a slate to Zechariah because he couldn't speak anymore to write the name. Then he wrote John. And the people marveled and said, what type of child will this be? And all at that same time, the Spirit of God came upon him. 
and the tongue sope, and the uh, rope of his tongue was loose, and he began to speak, and he began to magnify the Lord. After finishing magnifying the Lord, then he kept quiet. He wasn't a talkative, but only one sentence. Only one sentence. He just told the angel, Angel, look at the message you have brought. You think I believe that? How shall this thing be? Because I'm old and my wife is old. Only one sentence, it cost him silence, compulsory silence for the rest for, for nine months. He said, I'm an angel come from the presence of God. Because you have challenged that message that is coming from the throne of God, you will not be able to speak until everything is done. Only one sentence. Why are we not careful? And you know, many people that say they are Christians, I don't commit adultery, I don't commit fornication, I don't gamble, gamble. I don't tell lies. How about Zacharias? You see adultery there? You see fornication there? How about Miriam? Do you see adultery there? Do you see fornication there? The way we use our tongue may tell whether we're going to get there or we're not going to get there. You see, if we look at our church, as many as we are now, and here we are at the workers' retreat, if you know the many stories that have been told since we came on Tuesday night. Did you hear? Hey, I heard it. I didn't know it was true. It's true. I'm coming from there. Did you hear? You heard it too. I heard. That's what we see today. Yeah, those people, they are just preaching. They are all liars. And it's on record. Did you see sister so and so? That, that Tommy, you tell me, we're adults together. Doesn't that one look like pregnancy? <laughs> Leave them in their deeper life. You see them? I see, don't talk. Oh. They are very close to the pastor. Because if you talk now, they will say discipline. So that's what they use now to quiet in us, to silence us. We cannot talk. And it's on record in heaven. Did you see the brother that preached the other time? The one that preached and everybody was praying and praying. Hey, I know him. I wonder why the people are even praying like that. Me? The person like that cannot preach and I'll be shouting and praying. What am I praying about? Come, let me tell you his story. It's from our place. And it's on record in heaven. Did you see that sister singing? They, they gave them special to sing. They are the favorites of the choir master. I can sing better. They'll never put me there. It's their girlfriend. They put it. Ah, you are talking like that. You Christian. And you say, you are accusing choir master of girlfriend. Shut up. What do you know? We, who have all the details. You people, you just come to church. Come to church. It's only when they read Bible to you and say, that shall be born again. Born again. That's what you say. We are the people that know the secret. I'm telling you that they just put their girlfriend there. Go and do this, go and do that. I know how to do the thing more than that lady that said that they said she'll sing something. It's because I'm not, I, I take my stand. And I say that nobody will be my boyfriend. And it's because they are committing sin. Did you ever see them? Eh? My conscience tells me that they are committing sin. And these people will tell us they are on their way to heaven. And they will say, well, we praise the Lord. We are deeper life number one, deeper life number two. Where? Many of us have gone and we are no more in the kingdom of God. Only gossiping. Only criticism. The pilgrims on their way to heaven. A lot of deception, a lot of hypocrisy. And uh, while our overseer is coming, uh, this is our sister. Ah, bro, pastor, ah, I wanted to greet you. Ah, on the ground they have gone, kneeling down. And then after the, after the overseer has gone, then another sister will say, ah, who is that that you are greeting? You respect these uh, people too much. Who is that you are greeting? Uh, it's, uh, it's a foolish man. If, if you see what they do in our region, ah, if I don't kneel down like that, <laughs> I get into trouble. That's why I do it for them. In my heart, I know who I am and I know what I'm doing. I, since they want respect, eh, I give it to them. I will not kneel down and die there. But that man, if I tell you, and then they will, for the next one hour, they are gossiping me about that overseer. If that overseer, maybe he went to drink water and he's coming back, as he's coming back, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. And then while the overseer is passing on the ground again, Pastor, 
We thank God. This retreat is wonderful. I never knew that we could enjoy a retreat like this. Pastor, I even thank God because if you didn't put my name that I'm a worker, how will I come? Pastor, we are praying for you. We never gossip about you. We are praying for you. Christians. Christians. And uh, when uh, the wife of the overseer is uh, passing, ah, sister, good morning, ma. Good morning, ma. And then, ah, what's her name? Who is that sister? Is the, you know, the big woman at the top is the wife of a uh, uh, chief overseer. And it, because if you don't greet her like that, they will say you don't greet them. And then they will go and take their baby and say, ah, sister, uh, what's the name of our child? Uh, what is the, and it's all hypocrisy. And after they have gone like that, then they'll talk with the other sister and say, you know, that's a woman. They just transferred them to our state, to our region. And those people, well, God will have mercy on these uh, wives or people. And, and yet, they will greet them as if they respect them very highly. Thank God there are people who respect their leaders genuinely. Thank God there are people who respect the wives of their leaders genuinely. But I'm telling you that apart from those genuine people, not everybody is genuine. There are hypocrites. How are we going to get to heaven in this condition? How can we be deceiving ourselves with the criticism, with the cutting down, with all the lies and the deception, and still eventually make it to heaven? But thank God the judgment day has not come. We can repent today. And we can change and turn everything around by the grace of God. And I pray we will change in Jesus' name. You know, how wonderful it will be. If all of us who are here now, all of us who are here, if the trumpet will sound, and then we just get up there, and from that other church denomination, they have only maybe about 10, and from this other place, they, they just have about 20. And then when we get to heaven, and then they say, Nigerians who are in heaven, you come to this mansion, deeper life. Come to this mansion, deeper life. Come to this mansion, deeper life. And you see the biggest mansions, and you have that house fellowship leader. You have that other colorful mansion, and they say it's deeper life. And all the other denominational people, those who are able to make it, those who are able to pass, are through passing through fire, they are able to make it. And we say, once in a while, you come across another denomination. And then they say, why? Deeper life monopolized evangelism in our country, in Nigeria. And they are monopolized in heaven. Look at the thousands and the millions of them. What a wonderful thing it will be. That all of us here, English, Yoruba, Edo, Igala, Isoko, all those languages that as the trumpet sounds like this, as Moses said unto Pharaoh, not a hoof shall we leave behind. And all of us completely will just go to be with the Lord. I think it will be wonderful. That's my desire for you. You know what? I don't want to go to heaven alone. I want to go with you. I don't want to just be there alone. You know, some people, they say, I want to get to heaven, I want to get to heaven. Yes, I want to get there too. But I don't want anyone here to miss that heaven. I want us to be there together. I've not finished all my outline, but it's not outline. It's time to pray. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. We want to be there together. We want to be there together. We want to be there together. Let's abandon all hypocrisy. Let's abandon all the criticisms. Let's abandon all the hypocrisy and all the things we are talking against our leaders, against our pastors, against our fellow members, against the children of God. Let us stand on the word of God. Let us stand on the word of God. We can get to heaven together. We can get to heaven together. We don't have to leave you behind. We can go together. We can go together. Let's hurry up and let's go together. Let's hurry up and let's go together. Where we have misused our tongue. Where we have criticized our fellow brother, our fellow sister. Where we have crucified the children of God. Where we have slandered. Where we have told lies. Where we have deceived. Where we are just gossiping. 
and where we do not respect even the message coming from our pastors anymore where we are just telling stories, 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 story upon stories about their wives, about the pastors, about the members of the choir, about those who are helping us to know the way of the Lord more. We are gossiping, criticism, slandering has taken over our lives. Let us talk to the Lord and say, Lord, have mercy upon us. Let our love be genuine. Let our respect be genuine. Let our conversation be genuine. Let our Christian life be genuine. We are on our way to heaven. Pilgrims to the heavenly city. Let's love one another. Let's respect one another. Let's control our tongue. Don't let your tongue drive you to hellfire. Don't let your tongue destroy you. Keep it under. Keep it under. Keep it under. Let there be no sin in our midst. Let there be no sin in our midst. We all want to make heaven at last. And we will, by the grace of God, we will, we will, we will. Heaven is our home. Heaven is our home. Heaven is our home. Are you going to allow your tongue to debar you from getting there? The gossiping, the criticisms, the slander, the tail bearing. Are you going to allow your tongue to close and to lock the gate of heaven against you? Let the elders respect the juniors. Let the junior ones respect the elders. Let it be a Christian church where parents love their children and children love their parents. Where husbands respect their wives and wives respect their husbands. Where members will honor their pastors and pastors will appreciate their members. Where holiness will be real, real and genuine. Let it be a church where there is no hypocrisy. Let's live the overcoming life. Let's live the overcoming life. Overcoming the flesh. Overcoming the world. Overcoming sin. Overcoming the devil. People don't want to gossip, they will come to you. But you'll say, no, 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 no. I've made up my mind. I'm not in that company again. I'm a pilgrim on my way to heaven. Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Our Father will come before you, Almighty God, Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We come before you repenting of all the things you have shown to us in our lives. We know we have offended you. We have used our tongues, not according to the word of God. Father, we are praying that you forgive us in Jesus' name. Every one of us without exception. Nobody can claim that he has not spoken a single word against another individual. 
Father, we are praying that the blood of Jesus will cleanse and wash us in Jesus' name. We are pleading because of your mercy, because of your love, that will wipe away what we have done and forgive us and cleanse us in Jesus' name. Father, we are praying that our tongue will be controlled by you in Jesus' name. We hand over our tongue, our mouth, every word that will be coming out from our mouth, we hand it over to you, control and guide in Jesus' name. Set a watch over our mouth in Jesus' name. Help us to be watchful over what thing that it will be coming out from our mouth in Jesus' name. You have commanded us from your word, learn to be quiet. Help us to be quiet in Jesus' name. Help us to speak where you want us to speak in Jesus' name. Help us, help us to be quiet and under the control of the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Father, as we are praying, we are making covenant with you that we we'll never go back to our fourth life in Jesus' name. Thank you because you know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh!